so uh, I think we'll get started. Um, so today's going to be a bit of a uh, crash course on branching processes um, in the form of a reminder of some of the basic facts about them, um, but also with a particular uh, focus on the case of Poisson branching processes, since that's the one that most naturally connects to uh, to the setting of random trees that we've been talking about so far. And then in Thursday and Friday's lectures, I'll use some of the facts from today uh, in the study of Erdos-Renyi random graphs and in particular component sizes in Erdos-Renyi random graphs. Um, so, uh, so the goal for today is so introduce branching processes I'll talk about survival and extinction of branching processes without proof, just as, so this is really in the way of a reminder. There are detailed proofs in the notes, uh, but I won't go over um, all of this in full detail. Uh, um, we'll talk about, um, so in this particular case of Poisson branching, uh, uh, we'll see that this yields um, uh, so um, so asymptot well, well we'll look a little bit at the asymptotics for survival probability um, we'll see the cycle lemma which is the tool that will allow us to uh, which which um, connects uh, uh, branching processes and random walks, and in particular allows uh, us in the Poisson case to see that the Borel uh, one is the um, size of a Poisson branching process. And then uh, we'll, talk, we'll also talk about branching process duality, which is what happens when you uh, condition a uh, it, so it relates uh, supercritical and subcritical branching processes, let's just say. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's where we're headed for today. Um, let me get started. So uh, so right. So first branching processes. So I want to introduce um, sort of the the setup for what a branching process is gonna is is gonna be for me. So um, so this is uh, the Ulam Harris formalism, uh, which was mentioned in fact just in passing. Uh, Sarah mentioned quite a bit in her lecture, but um, one of the things that uh, that she mentioned in passing uh, was the um, Ulam Harris formalism for uh, for branching processes. So uh, um, we're going to uh, define the Ulam Harris tree um, so this is um, this is an infinite tree with vertex set uh, denoted by u which is the union over n at least zero of n to the n. Okay, so that means that, um, so we'll take by definition uh, n to the empty set to be uh, n to the zero to just be a single element set um, containing what will be a root vertex. And then, so n to the n, uh, you know, corresponds to uh, strings of integers of length, um, of length n. Okay, and um, so the the way the tree is constructed, so there's the root um, the root uh, phi, and then uh, so the root has um, countably infinitely many children indexed by the so this is the first generation one, two, three, and so on. Okay, and then each of these um, each of these uh, nodes themselves has countably many children uh, so indexed as um, in order as one, one, uh, so one, two, one, three, 
et cetera. Okay, so every node has countably many children and the way that the nodes are labeled, the children of a given node uh, just receive the label of the parent um, uh, and then appended to that is one, two, three, and so on. Okay, so, um, so the root is the empty set and then a node uh, whose label is V1 up to Vn um, will have a parent which is just V1 up to Vn minus one. Uh, so that's um, the parent of V and then children. Uh, so V comma I, if you like, or let me just, let me omit the comma VI, I at least one. Okay, so those are V1 up to VN comma I, where I ranges over positive integers. Okay, so I suppose I'm using, um, I seem to be using uh, N to mean uh, positive integers here. Okay, so maybe I'll write um, just to be uh, uh, consistent with previously where that um, was non-negative integers, I'll write n plus here. Okay, so um, so this is um, this is the Ulam Harris tree, um, and uh, it, so it has a property that um, uh, so no, there's a there's sort of canonical labeling of the vertices of the tree, but the point is that nodes, um, sort of the children of each node have a left to right or youngest to oldest order, which corresponds to the increasing labels of the last coordinate. Okay, so um, so with this um, with this Ulam Harris tree, now we can define a plane tree. Um, so a plane tree. Uh, and these are what our branching processes are going to be is random plane trees. So it's a subset of the Ulam Harris tree uh, with the following properties. So it should contain the, uh, the root and um, it should have the property that if a node is in the tree, then its parent is in the tree. And finally, uh, it should have the property that um, if a node is in the tree and some node VI is also in the tree, then VJ is in the tree for all J from one to I. Okay, so what this is saying is that um, if, I, uh, if I want to draw you a tree, I say that the root has three children, those children should be labeled one, two, three. They shouldn't be labeled, uh, you know, one, um, one, three, four in this drawing. Okay, so you're, you, the, the children are always labeled of, of a given node. If you're going to have K children, you have to pick the first K children within the Ulam Harris tree. Okay, so that, that way, um, that corresponds to, um, th that sort of explains the, the use of this word plane tree. It says that, um, you know, if I draw a given tree uh, uh, in the plane, so here's an example, okay, then I can, just by looking at the drawing, I can canonically identify it uh, um, as a uh, as a subtree of the Ulam Harris tree. So the root has label zero, the children must be labeled one, two, three, four, and then the children of three would then be three, one, and three, two here, and three, two has a single child which is labeled three, two, one. Okay, so that's, um, uh, so, uh, so, Ula, so plane trees are subtrees of the Ulam Harris tree with this property. Equivalently, they're rooted um, they're rooted, if you like, unlabeled trees endowed with uh, a planar embedding so that each, or, or equivalently a left to right order on the children of each node. Okay, so um, this sort of corresponds to having a left to right ordering on children.
Okay, so now um, uh, now we'll inject randomness into the into the picture. Um, so an offspring distribution, by an offspring distribution, I just mean a probability distribution supported on the non-negative integers. Uh, so. Okay, and then, um, so I'll call a bien -aimé tree This is just a random tree, a random plane tree. For each node independently has a mu distributed number of children. Okay, so you've probably, um, you know, most of you have seen these, or many of you have seen these under the name uh, Galton Watson tree. Okay, and I'm pitching a name change um, uh, for the whole community um, uh, in a recent paper I wrote, and here, and in general, I'm going to keep flogging this um, because. Uh, First of all, Bionde made um, introduce these first and more mathematically rigorously. And second, the motivation for their study by Galton and Watson was quite directly linked to their um, interest in, in eugenics and um, racial supremacy. So um, I don't think that there's any solid logic for continuing to name these objects after Galton and Watson, especially given that Bionde made got there first. Um, okay, so they're gonna be Bionde made trees for us in this course. Um, and now, um, so uh, one way to, um, so one, uh, uh, so let's make, let's make this, um, let's concretely construct a BNA matrix just so that everyone is really on the same page. Okay, so um, let's say that, uh, so I just need one definition first. So for um, uh, a plane tree T um, uh, and, uh, and some node V and T, we write, uh, so C of, you might remember this notation. So C V T for the number of, Children of V in T. So this is this is in the in this Ulam Harris formalism. This is the same as um, saying it's the the largest I such that V I is a node of T. Okay, and then um, so then we can um, so uh, let's let's take a field of random variables indexed by the vertices of the Ulam Harris tree. So these are going to be independent and identically distributed with law uh, mu. Okay. And then, um, then we can just um, uh, define a random tree T by, so we'll always put the uh, so this is a random plane tree, so it has to contain uh, the root of the Ulam Harris tree. Um, and then, um, you know, for each um, recursively, if V is a node of T, then we set the number of children of V in T to just be given by the random variable XV. Okay. Um, so this uh, is uh, bien aimé mu tree. Okay, so just um, to 
uh, give you a, a picture, you know, if so we start from the root, um, if the Sometimes it's nice to draw tr um, trees going down the page rather than up the page, like genealogical trees rather than um, like trees in a forest, uh, just so that you don't have to sort of predict in advance where at the bottom to start, you know, before you know how far, how far, how big the tree is going to be. So if X naught is three, then that means that we have to put the nodes with labels one, two, and three into the tree, and then recursively, you know, maybe X one is 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 one. Uh, so we'd better put uh, the node one into the tree, and that means uh, the node one one into the tree, you know. And then uh, if x one one is two, then that means that uh, you know the our tree is going to contain the nodes with labels one 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 and one one two, um, and you know maybe x two is um, x two is zero. So this child here has. Um, that has no uh, children of its own. X3 is two, so we put three one and three two into the tree and so on and so forth. Okay, so I actually just um, sort of was exploring this tree in something like a depth first search manner, which will come up later as well. Um, okay, um, so that's, um, that's sort of a, uh, Slightly informal and then quite concrete description of the uh, of a of what a bien-aimé tree looks like. Okay, and um, you know you can also you can also be characterized um, by saying that um, you know uh, uh, so it's characterized by its finite dimensional distributions, if you like. So you could say that. Um, for any uh, locally finite plane tree T, uh, th I'm, and I'm going to introduce some notation on the fly. I actually want this notation, so it's useful to be giving this equivalent definition as well uh, for that reason. Um, so uh, the probability that the first n levels of, uh, of the random tree are agree with this deterministic tree um, is just given by, uh, so the product over the first n minus one levels of the deterministic tree of mu c v t. Okay, so what's this, so what's my notation here? Uh, this, um, so, uh, so for a plane tree, T, uh, so I'll write you know, T less than or equal to N to be uh, the tree T. Remember, this is a subset. This is just a set of nodes of the Ulam Harris tree. And then I just take the intersection with that, uh, the intersection of that with the first N levels uh, um, of, the, of the Ulam Harris tree. Okay. And so, um, and similarly, you know, t less than n takes the intersection with the first n minus one levels. Okay, and what's this? What's this um, probability? What's this identity uh, really saying? It's saying that you know, if I want to observe a particular, you know, if I'm, I'm if I'm interested in whether my tree t looks like this for the first four levels, you know, so right, this is. Um, uh, uh, so level um, n to the zero, n to the one, uh, n two, n three, n four. Then what I need to what what needs to happen in order to, for for my random tree to to look like this deterministic tree for the first four levels, is that the first three levels have to reproduce correctly. The root should have four children. The last three of them should have no children themselves. Then this one should have two children. These two should each have the correct number of children, and then the third level should reproduce correctly. And I don't need to know what the fourth level does in order to know that the first four levels agree. That's why we have a less than or equal here and a less than here. Okay. So um, is the is the is the formalism reasonably clear? Okay. So now I'm going to state a couple of facts without proof that if you've seen branching processes at all before, you've seen the proofs of, and if you haven't seen them before, 
The proofs are beautiful and they're in the notes and I uh, strongly encourage you to read them. So, um, so let's um, fix an offspring distribution. Mu um, and I'll let uh, alpha be the expected value corresponding to this offspring distribution, so the sum of i mu of i, okay? And then I'll uh, let t be uh, uh, bien aimé, so this is my, here after my notation for a bien aimé mu tree. Um, and uh, I'll write um, m n to be t n over alpha to the n. Okay, so um, so I'm I'm using now this notation t n by analogy uh, up here. So um, so t n is just t intersection n to the n, so that you know t less than or equal to n is I could also write as the union over k at most n of t k. It's just the number of so so this is this is the set of nodes at the nth level of the tree. And so the size of this is the number of nodes at the nth level of, this is the size of this is the number of nodes at the nth level of the tree. Okay, so, um, so this is the number of nodes at level n of our bien tree normalized by the mean to the n. Um, and, uh, and then we'll let m, so this is, this is a random variable and we'll define, uh, M to be the limb soup as n tends to infinity of mn. Okay, so then, uh, then this sequence is a martingale for the natural filtration. Uh, so, say the filtration generated by the random variables uh, up to up to level n in this construction. Okay. Um, and um, so MN converges almost surely to M and uh, because it's a non-negative martingale, uh, the expected value of the limit is at most one. Okay, you see M, M zero is just the number of nodes at level zero divided by one. So that's just one. So because it's a martingale, the mean of MN is one for all N and then by Fatou's lemma, um, the mean of M must be at most one. Okay, and one thing that I'll come, you know, time permitting, I plan to come back to later in the course is the necessary and sufficient condition for, uh, for this expectation to be equal to one. So that's known as the keston stigum theorem. It's a beautiful um, fact in probability um, that's not so often covered in a first uh, course on uh, stochastic processes. Okay, so that's that's one basic fact. Um, I'll just mention, you know, I'm not actually assuming here that alpha is finite, but if alpha is infinite, then all of these values are 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 zero, say. Um, and then, well, you know, if I, well, there's some question of what happens if uh, if uh, what's infinity to the zero. Let me not let me not worry about that. Okay, so that's one basic fact um, about uh, branching processes. Another is what I, you know. I think is fair to call the fundamental theorem of branching processes. So this uh, characterizes the um, when the um, when branching processes have a probability, a, a positive probability of being um, infinite. So if we take a bien aimé mu branching process um, and write Q for the probability that um, the size is finite. Then, um, then the theorem says that uh, that Q is less than one. So the probability uh, of observing a finite tree is less than one, if and only if um, either alpha is greater than one. So if the mean is greater than one, then uh, then the probability of uh, of survival of an infinite tree is positive, or um, uh, there's one other special case, which is when mu one is one. So in other words, when every node deterministically has exactly one child, then obviously the, the tree is infinite as well. Okay, so um, 
so I won't, uh, I won't go over the proof of this, but I will remind you of the sort of key step because it's useful to have the, the picture. Um, uh, so let's let, uh, let's let uh, GS be the um, moment generating function of, uh, of, the, of mu. So, so the expected value of s to the x, where um, x is mu distributed. Okay, so in other words, um, so this is um, just the sum uh, uh, k at least zero of s to the k times the probability that x is equal to k. Okay, um, then um, let's, I'm gonna just grab over here from my image file um, the, the plot of this. So again, anyone who's um, seen branching processes has seen these pictures. Um, then the key point is that uh, this extension probability is a fixed point of G of S, okay? Then uh, in fact, the only uh, solutions of G of S equals S our Q, this extinction probability, and one. Okay, so um, so the picture is that when uh, when the mean is greater than one, there's a there's a non-trivial fixed point, a fixed point other than one. When the mean is greater than or equal to one, there's no such fixed point. Okay, so um, so that's um, I, I as I said, I'm not going to prove any of that, um, but it's uh, sort of beautiful basic information about branching processes. Um, what I would like to do is um, now think about this fixed point property for the special case of, of Poisson branching, because uh, we'll actually, it'll actually be useful for us to have, a, to extract a bit more information out of this, out of this picture. So, uh, so this, if you like, is a case study. Um, so here now I'm taking T to be a Poisson lambda bien um, And I'm going to write, this is an important enough case that I'll, uh, um, it'll get its own name. So theta of lambda for the, not the extinction probability, but the survival probability, the probability that the tree is infinite. Okay, so that one minus theta of lambda is, is the Q from before, okay? And then if you, uh, so th this, um, this fact up here tells us that, um, so one minus theta lambda is the same as G of one minus theta lambda, um, right? The extinction probability is a fixed point and you can work out that that's equal to E to the minus lambda theta of lambda. Okay, so um, in the Poisson case, you have this very, ex well, it's still an implicit um, definition of theta lambda, but it's, um, it's quite a clean formula satisfied by the survival probability. Okay, and from this, um, from this formula, you can extract um, information about the asymptotic behavior of this survival probability. So um, I'll say, um, as I'll, this is, I'm leaving as an exercise. So theta of lambda is smooth away from lambda equals one. Um, it's concave on one infinity. Um, and um, the derivative in lambda uh, increases to two as lambda decreases to one. Okay, so the picture uh, uh, that that's giving of this curve is, let me give you a little drawing of that. Right, so if here's, um, uh, I guess that that's makes one about there. So um, I'm gonna draw theta of lambda 
in black. So it goes along at zero until lambda is one. The fundamental theorem tells us that when the mean is less than one, the probability of survival is zero. And then it takes off at slope two and then gradually curves down from there. Okay, so this is, um, this is what theta lambda looks like. And so, it, um, so in particular, this means that, uh, uh, you know, if um, we'll be interested in this case uh, a little later in the course. So if, um, if, if, we're, if we just look just above, um, so when the mean is just above one, so if T is a Poisson one plus epsilon uh, bien -imetri, Uh, then, uh, then the probability uh, that it's infinite is like uh, two plus little o one times epsilon as epsilon decreases to zero. Okay, so that's just saying that this um, that this uh, this curve has slope two from the right uh, as uh, at at uh, at the value one there. I don't haven't quite drawn a line with slope two, but anyway. Okay, any questions about that part of the picture? So what I'd like to do now is um, connect. Um, well, the second, the second one of the things I mentioned, I think the second is um, talk about the cycle lemma, which connects random trees and random walks, and allows us to. Uh, find uh, formulas for the probability of observing trees of a fixed size. Okay, so um, so that's the next uh, the next step. Okay, so um, so first I need to tell you about the um, the what I mean by the depth first Q process of of a tree. So um, so given a finite plane tree, uh, so so the depth first Q process. of t, um, so, and I'll, I'll write dfqp, so I don't have to write that all the time. Um, uh, so it is, so it's defined as follows. So we're going to list the vertices of the tree in lexicographic order. as V1 up to Vn, so then N is the size of the tree, okay? And maybe it's worth having an example uh, right away. Uh, so you have a picture in mind. Right, so in this example, the order is, um, is the root, then one, then two, uh, sorry, no, yeah, the root, then one, then two, then three, then, Three one, three one one, three two, three two one, three two two, three two three. Right, it's just the sort of dictionary order uh, on the vertices, um, and then uh, so for i from uh, zero to n, we'll define uh, s i of t or SIT to just be the sum for J from one up to I of the number of children of vertex J and T minus one. Okay, so the way, let, let's, let's draw the graph of that, uh, the sort of, this is the, 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 the sequence of values. But first I wanna say what this corresponds to if you've done any computer science, you've probably seen uh, depth first search before. So when, when you, what happens is, when you want to explore a graph by depth first search is you explore a node, uh, that means you, um, 
you ask, you query all of its neighbors in the graph and you put those in a queue for, uh, for exploration of their neighbors in turn, okay? And the rule for um, uh, what order you explore things in is effectively just uh, uh, last in, first out. So more recent things get explored first. Okay, and that's what's, um, so that's what's, uh, if, if you think of exploring here, you discover, you, you start from um, having just one uh, explored node, you explore its children, you discover three nodes, you explore them in left to right order. Um, and this process S is just tracking the number of nodes that have been discovered, but have not yet been explored. So we don't yet know uh, what their children are going to be, how many children they're going to have in the tree. Okay, so, um, so let's now, having sort of said that, let me draw the picture. So uh, uh, here we're, um, so at, 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 at going along this ordering, so at time zero, uh, we are not summing anything. We're at zero. Uh, then at time one, we add, uh, we add three and subtract one because the root has three children. Okay, so uh, we get value two. Then the next node has zero children. So we add zero minus one, we subtract one, we're down to one. Uh, node two has no children, we subtract one, we're down to zero. Node three has two children, which sends us up by one. Uh, node three, node uh, three one has one child. So one minus one is zero, the, uh, the process doesn't change. Three one one has no children. 3, 2 has three children, we go up by two, and then 3, 2, 1 has no children, 3, 2, 2 has no children, 3, 2, 3 has no children. Okay, so this, this sequence of values here is just plotting the, the process S in time. Okay, and, um, you know, as I'll, I'll state it as an exercise, um, uh, but it sort of, it should feel quite clear that um, so the tree T can be recovered from its depth risk Q process, right? And that's sort of not at all hard to see. If I erase the, the tree and only show you this picture, uh, well, you know, the fact that the first, the fact that the first difference in the sequence is two means that the first, the first, node that we explored must have had three children, right? So that tells us the root has three children. Then we see two down steps. So the first two children have no, ch have no children of their own. We see an up step, which means we have to have, an, have discovered a node with two children. Then a, a level step means a node with one child. Down step means that node has no children of its own and so on and so forth. We see a node up step of two gives us a node with three children and then three leaves corresponding to these three down steps. Okay, so that's, um, so, so going, um, going from the excursion um, back to the, uh, back to the tree um, is, uh, is not hard and formalizing that I'll leave as an exercise. I use the word excursion just now. Let me, um, let me actually define, um, so that's an important uh, concept. So let me define it. So, um, if, if you're given integers, so b at least zero and positive n, so I'll say that a random walk excursion uh, from zero, zero to uh, n minus b, um, so this is just an integer valued sequence. Uh, so S0, S1 up to Sn uh, such that, so S, it should start at zero and end at minus B. It should have the properties that, uh, um, so, uh, S, so this, the down, it never makes downward steps of size bigger than minus one. Uh, 
And also it has the property that it stays strictly greater than minus B until the end. Okay. So, um, so this is a property that's, um, so, so, so this, uh, this walk here is indeed a random walk excursion. Okay. Well, you can see it in this picture. It starts at zero, zero. It ends at, um, well, n minus one and n is, you know, 10 here, I guess. Um, and it has stayed above minus uh, one in the meantime, but that's, uh, you know, that's in fact always what happens. It has to finish at minus one because um, if you look at the value Sn, it's the sum of uh, the number of vertices. So it's the sum over vertices of the tree of number of children minus one. But if you sum the number of children in a tree uh, over, all, uh, over all nodes of the tree, then you're just counting each edge once, okay? So the if we ignore the minus one, then we're just getting the number of edges of the tree T. And then if we include the minus ones, then we're subtracting off the number of vertices of the tree. Okay, so this, the tree always has one fewer edges than vertices. So this is minus one. And, um, and SK is indeed at least zero for, uh, for K less than N. Um, that's just saying that when you've when you're in the midst of exploring the tree, there's always um, at least one vertex that you've discovered but haven't yet explored. Okay, so this um, this depth first Q process is indeed, uh, you know, precisely logging. Well, up there's a there's a correction of one, but um, you know, if I add one to these values, then what it's logging is precisely the number of vertices that have been discovered but not yet explored. Okay, so. Um, uh, so this um, S not up to Sn is a uh, random walk excursion from zero, zero to N minus one. Okay, and um, so uh, I'll get, uh, I'm gonna get to the cycle lemma in just a second, but before I do, I'd like to just, um, you know, remark on one corollary of this exercise, if you like, of the fact of this equivalence, this bijection between random walk excursions and, uh, and bien aimé or and plane trees. Um, so, uh, so this says that um, if I have, an offspring distribution mu, uh, and I let xi be iid with law mu, uh, and write, so Sn, like in this depth first Q process, will just be the sum for i from one to n of xi minus one. Uh, and I look at uh, the first time k that uh, sk is, is equal to minus one. Uh, then this is, then this, then this time tau has the same distribution as the size of uh, mu distributed bien -aimé tree. So if t is bien -aimé mu distributed, then the size of T is, uh, is exactly distributed as tau. Okay. Uh, is the statement clear? So effectively, uh, what the, um, you know, what the statement is saying, if you like, is that you can think of a sequence of something like you can think of the se a sequence of IID uh, random variables with law mu as corresponding to the lexicographic ordering of the um, sequence of numbers of children in a, in a bien aimé mu tree. So that, um, that shouldn't feel uh, too surprising when it's stated like that. Um, but um, so let me just give you sort of, the only thing to be a little bit careful about in the proof is that uh, if the, you know, this, this bijection 
only works for finite trees. If we had an infinite tree here, then it's not clear that there's a depth first Q process that, com that completely explores the whole tree. So we just need to be a tiny bit careful uh, to, uh, to make sure we don't get into any trouble uh, with that, uh, but we really don't. So, um, so the point is that, uh, so for any random walk excursion, uh, so, S not S1 up to Sn from 0, 0 to n minus 1. Uh, we can ask about the, uh, the probability that um, the, so the depth first Q process of T is equal to this particular sequence S not up to Sn. Okay, and now that's, um, so because the degrees in T are independent um, and, uh, uh, and have law mu, just like the values in the sequence, that's the same as the probability that, um, that um, so SI equals SI for I from zero to n. Okay, but now in each of these probabilities, note if the if this if the depth first Q process agrees with this random walk excursion for the for the first n steps, then that in particular means that the that this tree does have exactly n nodes because the because the depth first Q process finishes precisely the first time that the random walk hits minus one. Okay, so this probability here is the same as the probability that the tree has size n and sit is si for i at most n. And likewise, on the right, if, if, the, if this random walk agrees with, S, uh, with, with si for i at most n, then, then tau is equal to n. So this is the probability that, uh, that tau is equal to n and si is given by little si. For i at most n. Okay, so now if you if you just sum this equality over all the possible random walk excursions um, from zero zero to n minus one, you get uh, uh, you get the equality that the probability that the tree has size n is the same as the probability that tau equals n. Okay, so um, so this step we've just used that the degrees are iid in the tree, and here we have a sequence of iid degrees. Um, then we've used that inserting these two probability these two events into the probability doesn't change the event. So in particular, it doesn't change the probability. Okay. Um, so there's a question in the chat, can't we generalize the depth first Q process by restricting on finite trees and then take depths to infinity? Um, the issue, I'll just answer that with a picture. Okay, so, um, you know, you can try, but if you, um, you know, imagine that you have a tree where there's some infinite ray, so a path to infinity, okay, then uh, in the depth, so if you look at the lex, the point is that if you look at the lexic, there is a lexicographic total order of the of the vertices of all these vertices of the Ulam Harris labels, but in that order, there's an infinite number of vertices that come before any vertex to the right of this path. So there's no way to, you know, in a sequential um, exploration, there's no way to define a depth first search that will ever um, explore the children of any of the nodes on the right here. Um, uh, breadth first search is a better bet. You can do a breadth first Q process and then work with um, finite trees just fine. Okay. Um, any uh, any questions about what I've said so far? Okay. Um, feel free to ask more questions. Um, okay. So I'll just remark. Um, if mu has mean one, Sn is a martingale, does that say anything about the tree in this case? 
Um, it doesn't instantly say something to me, um, but it's true. It's also a random walk. I mean, one way to prove, in fact, so in some sense, uh, you know, depending on your background, but possibly a more satisfying proof of the of the fact that when the um, when the mean offspring distribution when 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 mu has mean one, then there's extinction. Is to say that um, S n then is a is a centered random walk, right? Because x x minus one has mean zero. So if you use the fact that a centered random walk almost surely takes arbitrarily small values, then in particular, it almost surely hits minus one. And that means the tree is almost surely finite. Okay, so that's a different proof of the fact that um, critical branching processes are almost surely finite. And in some sense, well, if you're, if you're used to random walks and transients and recurrence, it might feel a little bit um, more concrete than the X point um, argument. But in some sense, they're not actually very different if you think about how you prove recurrence in the first place. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, so I just want to make one remark uh, before getting onto the cycle lemma, which I've been saying I will do for a while. Uh, okay, so this is that uh, the proposition. Uh, so what am I calling the proposition here? Um, uh, well, the, the let me say the exercise. I'm not exactly following my notes today for some reason, which is a little bit scary to me because it generally gets me into trouble, um, but we'll see. Um, so the exercise extends uh, from trees to forests. Okay, um, so, and here by forests, I mean, um, so ordered sequences of plane trees. And the, the rule for this is just um, uh, to concatenate the sequence of depth first walks. Okay, so let me draw a quick example of what I mean by that. Um, so imagine that we have a, a sequence of plane trees. Uh, I'll draw each one a different color so that you can more easily see what's going on in the uh, in, in the um, excursion I'm about to draw. So let's think about this sequence, uh, ordered sequence left to right, blue, uh, black, blue, yellow, red of, of plane trees, okay? Um, then uh, let's draw their, um, their depth first Q processes in order. So the first one starts at zero, goes up to one, uh, then it goes back down to zero, then it stays at zero, then it goes down to minus one, right? We go up one, down one, zero, down one. Okay, now we're gonna do the, um, the process for the, for the blue tree, so I'll draw it in blue. Um, the first step, one child, so we have value zero, then zero children, value minus one. For the yellow tree, we just instantly see zero children, we go down by one, and then for the uh, red tree, uh, we go up by one, up by another one, and then down three times. Okay, so this is really um, the concatenation of the depth first Q processes of these four trees, where each, each one you sort of recenter your coordinate axis at wherever the previous exploration uh, stopped. Okay, so. Um, so in this um, uh, uh, in this exploration, so um, so the exploration of one tree ends, uh, and the next tree starts. Each time, uh, the process hits a new local minimum. And that's precisely because each of these, for each tree, the depth first Q process is an excursion. It stayed 
above wherever it started until the tree is finished being explored and then it took a new step to minus one. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Lior asked about um, whether the depth of the Q is now SI plus K, where K is the number of components of the forest. Uh, yeah, well, maybe K is the number of components that you've previously explored. Um, so uh, yeah, so we saw that you have to you have to shift up by one to see the, the length of the queue for the first tree, shift up by two to see the length of the second tree and so on. Okay, um, so that means, um, so, so here this, um, the, the bijection extends to forests, so depth versus queue processes of, of, an, of ordered, so if, if you give me the depth versus queue process of an ordered plane forest uh, with n vertices and b trees, then this, uh, this corresponds uh, under the bijection, right? This, this is the bijection I'm talking about here to uh, random walk excursions. From uh, zero, zero to N minus B. Okay. okay. And we've already defined what, um, what we mean by excursions here. It has to, you know, stay above minus B until the very end. Um, it steps, it makes steps that are like minus one, zero, one, two, but never further down than minus one at a time. Um, and it finishes at N minus B. Right, so now I'm in shape to, uh, to state the cycle lemma and I'm gonna prove, there's two proofs in the notes. I'm gonna give a proof uh, that's, um, of a slightly less general result than the most general version of the cycle lemma, but I think it's also um, slightly less well known. So I thought for those of you who've already who already kind of know the field, it might um, be still be new to you. Um, so, but I'm, I'll first state the most general version. Uh, so this is um, Duas's cycle lemma. Okay, so it says the following, if we fix integers uh, x1 up to xn, these should maybe, I should maybe call these y or something because they're not, these are really the, the values minus one, not the, not, the random, not the random numbers of children, but those values minus one. So these are all, but I'm gonna stick, here I'm gonna stick with my notes because I don't want to get into trouble. So these are all uh, at least minus one and there's some should be equal to some value minus b, which is negative or non-positive anyway, okay? Then uh, if I look at, um, I'm gonna look at um, the, the sequence of partial sums of these random variables, but with this sequence cyclically shifted to start at index um, j rather than, um, rather than uh, at index zero, okay? So I'll let uh, S J uh, I be X. So J plus one mod N plus X J plus two mod N all the way up to X J plus I mod N. Okay, so we're just starting, starting the sum off after X J and when we get to the end, we continue summing from the start. Okay, then there are exactly uh, B values of J for which, uh, so S, uh, SJ, uh, not up to SJN is a uh, an excursion, or in other words, uh, for which um, SJ uh, I is strictly less than minus B uh, for I less than N. Okay. Um, so 
in particular, you know, um, for B is one, the sort of case of trees, this says that if I take this, um, if I take all of these possible sequences of partial sums, the one where you just sum these in order, or the one where you move x1 to the end, or the one where you move x1 and x2 to the end, so on and so forth, there's exactly one of those that actually corresponds to the depth first Q process of a tree, because that, that there's only one of those that is uh, that gives you an excursion. Okay, so is the is the statement of the of the proof of the of the cycle lemma clear? So um, you know maybe it's worth um, uh, looking at this picture. Okay, so you know a nice thing about this cycle M is you can do lots of things quite visually. So what does it mean to um, you know start the sum at a different value? Well, we can just sort of think about taking the uh, taking the sequence and concatenating a copy of it onto the end of the previous sequence. Okay, so now um, we had better flag where that um, uh, special point was, though. Right. So we could look at um, we could look at the sequence um, of partial sums uh, at this sequence of partial sums, or we could start here and look at this sequence of partial sums. That's not an excursion, right? Because it it instantly steps to minus one, right? And similarly, if we start here, it's not an excursion. It instantly steps to minus one. And if we start here, well, it doesn't instantly step to minus one, but it does step to minus one before the end and so on. So the, the point is in each of these drawings only, well, this is saying if, you know, another way of saying this is if I start from the tree, if, if, I, if, I, if I look at any cyclic shift other than the trivial one, then I'm not gonna get an excursion out of that. Okay, so that's, um, so, so in the, 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 the cycle limit in this form has its proof uh, is in the notes and it's a beautiful proof if you haven't seen it before. So I strongly encourage you to read it, but I'm gonna go and give you the proof of a slightly less general statement in the setting, in a slightly more, um, well, in the setting of IID random variables as well. So not just arbitrary integer values. Okay, so um, so this is, um, this is a corollary of, uh, of the cycle lemma, and I'll prove the corollary without recourse to the cycle lemma. So let's let Xi be IID uh, uh, taking values in minus one, zero, one, and so on. And then for n at least zero, I'll let um, Sn be x1 plus xn. Okay, and I'll set uh, tau k to be the um, the first time that s m is equal to k. Okay, so it's the hitting time. This is the hitting time of k by this random walk. Okay, then uh, for all um, b from zero to n, uh, the probability that we first hit minus b at time n is just b over n times the probability that sn is minus b. Okay. Uh, so, um, so the way you would prove this using the cycle lemma is just by um, conditioning on the event that, um, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of condition on the values x1 up to xn subject to this condition and then ask, well, if I tell you the, if I tell you the value is x1 up to xn, but not, um, but not what, but only up to cyclic shift, okay? I, I say these are, these are the values, but I'm not telling you which, uh, in all in all of these n possibilities, which of the n, um, uh, which order they actually appeared in, 
Okay. Well, then you can tell that the you can tell the value of the sum even if I don't tell you um, the position on that cyclic shift of the sum uh, of the of the sequence. Okay. So you can tell that this event happens, and then of those, you know, because the random variables are iid, any one of those n possibilities is equally likely. But of those n possibilities, only b of them actually correspond to an excursion by by the cycle limit. Okay. So that um, and 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 in order to have the first hitting time of minus BBN, you have to get an excursion. Okay, so that's sort of how the corollary um, connects to the, um, to the cycle lemma and how you'd prove it if you wanted to prove it using the cycle lemma. Um, but as I said, we'll prove it uh, directly instead. Um, so, uh, and for that, I'm, I'm just going to state one uh, simple uh, lemma before we, before we start the, the proof. So, So this, um, this says that um, for any b from zero to n, the expected value of x1 given, so I'm now working in the setting of the corollary, the expected value of x1 given that sn is equal to minus b is minus b over n, okay? And uh, this is really just due to um, the exchangeability of the random variables, but um, let me, Write it out. So the um, so the expect so minus b is the expected value of S n given that S n is equal to minus b. That this looks like a bit of a silly thing to write. Um, but then by linearity of expectation, I can write that as a sum for i from one to n of the expected value of x i given that S n is minus b. Okay. And um, and now because um, uh, because x1 up to xn are exchangeable, these expected values, even in, even conditionally, and this is that, well, this event is also an exchangeable event we're conditioning on, these expected values must all be equal. And so then they must all be equal to um, the expected value of x1, given that sn is minus b. Okay, and this is the, this is the lemma if we just divide through by n. Okay, so this just says that if I tell you the final value, then on average, each step contributes equally to um, to uh, to that final sum. Okay. So um, so now um, uh, we can prove the corollary. Okay. Um, and we're going to do so um, uh, by induction. So this I, I was surprised that there could could be an inductive proof of this when um, when I first saw this proof. I think that it's, um, it's due to uh, Remco van der Hofstad and um, darn it, I put the other a reference in the notes. It's an Amer American Mathematical Monthly article from a decade or so ago. Um, and I'm forgetting some, um, some name I know very well, which is probably a sign of aging. Um, but okay, so uh, leaving that aside, let's go on with the proof. So um, let, we have some small cases to take care of. Um, so uh, if, um, if n is one, um, then there's two cases, b is zero or one. If b is zero, then both sides are zero, right? You can't, um, the first hitting time of zero is not one, it's zero, and the right-hand side is zero. So here both sides are zero. And if n is one and b is one, then uh, then both sides are just the probability that the that x one is minus one. Right? When I talk about both sides, I'm talking about both sides of the identity we're trying to prove. So the n is one case is is fine. And now uh, when n is uh, bigger than one, it's actually still useful to uh, extract the b is zero case first. So then both sides are again zero. Okay, now let's focus in on the heart of the matter, which is uh, when n is uh, uh, at least two and b is at least one. Okay, well, maybe I need a new page for that. Good, so, so what are we trying to, let me pull this down. This is what we're trying to prove. Okay. 
And let's do a sort of classic probabilistic argument, which is just um, can think about conditioning on the first step of the walk and seeing what happens. So a one step argument. Okay, so the probability that we first hit minus b at time n, we can write as a sum uh, over s at least minus one of the probability that the first step has value s times the probability that we first hit um, uh, minus b at n given that x1 is s. Okay, and now um, uh, this can be rewritten, right? Because we're here we have a random walk. We're saying, uh, we're asking uh, about first hitting some level minus b if the first step was, um, was to some value s, which is at least minus one. Uh, then now we have, um, so we have time, the remaining time here is n minus one. And we now have this height that we have to descend um, for the first time uh, uh, in, in those n minus one steps. So this is just the probability that tau of minus b plus s, that's the height of this interval here, is n minus one. Okay, maybe I'll um, put that in a different color so it's easier to read. Okay, so this is, so this is the sum s at least minus one of, uh, of the probability x1 is s times the probability that tau of minus b plus s is n minus one. Okay. Uh, and now we can use induction, right? To say that this, because this is now an n minus one step walk, this is b plus s over n minus one times the probability that sn minus one is minus b plus s. Okay, let me just copy this down. Okay, so that was induction. Uh, and now, uh, uh, now I want to combine these two terms to try to recover something about a, an n-step random walk. Okay, so if I think of, um, you know, I can think of the this this prob the probability that s n minus one is something is the same as the probability that s n minus s one is something, right? Because this each of these is just a sum of n minus one i i d steps with the same law. Okay. And that, that's useful because Sn minus one is independent of X one. So then if I write, if I rewrite this Sn minus one as Sn minus S one, then I can recombine this probability and this probability into a single one. Okay, so this is the same as the probability. That's what I'm doing now, that X one is S and Sn minus X one is minus B plus S, okay. Uh, Sort of in the way, um, and now that's the same as uh, I've written x one, but um, s one is x one, so that's I can write s one or x one there, right? So that's the same as the probability that x one is s and s n is minus b. So we say first we make a plus s step, and then the remainder of the walk takes us from s down to minus b. We don't know how it's doing so in that probability. Okay, now let me just use Bayes to write that as the probability that X1 is equal to S given that S SN is minus B times the probability that SN is minus B. Okay, that, um, that you know, might seem like a reasonable step because we're interested in seeing a probability SN is minus B on the right and now we have one. Okay, and the identity we're trying to prove. Okay, so now that we've we've reduced our um, our uh, well, we've sh shown that the probability we're trying to analyze is equivalent to a sum over s at least minus one, b plus s over n minus one, times the probability that x one is s given that s n is minus b, uh, and then all of that times uh, the probability that. Uh, 
uh, Sn is minus B. Okay, so that probability comes out and so does the uh, one over N minus one. So we have probability Sn is minus B over N minus one and then the sum S is at least minus one B plus S times the probability X1 is S given Sn is B. Okay, and now, um, so the, the B term here, these probabilities sum to one. So the B term just kicks out a B, okay? And then the, the S term is the expected value of X1 given that Sn is B. Okay, so this whole thing is the probability Sn is minus B over N minus one times B plus the expected value of X1 given that Sn is minus B, okay? But now this we said was precisely minus B over N, okay? So that this, this term here is B times N minus one over N and, the N min and that gives us a, 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 a B over N overall, okay? So this is just B over N times the probability that Sn is B. Okay, so that's, um, that's I think quite a lovely inductive proof. And I don't know, in, in some sense, it, it feels like um, there's still something uh, a little bit cyclic going on in the way that you extract this X1 and then make it play a different role. So um, I, I, I don't, um, it doesn't actually use a cyclic um, exchangeability in the proof, but, um, uh, but I think that somehow informing this, this sort of cleverness right here is still some thought about cyclic exchangeability. Okay, so um, I don't think I have time to do both of the things I wanted to do in the rest of the lecture, which were talk about um, the um, Borel distribution and talk about um, branching process duality. So I think that um, I'll just talk about the Borel distribution and then leave the branching process duality for next lecture, which it fits in pretty well with the um, erdos uh stuff I wanted to talk about anyway. Um, so any, um, any questions about uh, what we've done so far before I do the last, uh, the last thing of the day? Okay. Feel free to chime in if you think of a question. Um, so, uh, so here's, this is, this is actually really directly a corollary of the, um, uh, of the cycle lemma. So, uh, let's let T be, uh, Poisson one bien aimé process. then uh, the size of T is Borel distributed. And let me remind you, that means that the probability that T has size N is N to the N minus one E to the minus N over N, uh, N factorial. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this in particular kind of is paying some dues from last week because last week we, uh, I sort of stated without proof that the Borel distribution is actually a probability distribution, okay? But now, once we know, you know, if you believe this corollary, which says that the probability that a Poisson one bien tree has size N is given by the Borel distribution, then these values must sum to one because we know that this, by the fundamental theorem of branching processes, we know that the probability of this tree is finite is one. So that, and the sum of these values is just the probability of the tree is finite. Okay, so this in particular does show that the, um, uh, the Borel distribution is, uh, so it shows that the sum of n to the n minus one, e to the minus n over n factorial is, this, which is one. Okay, and um, and so the proof of this isn't hard. So let's um, let's give ourselves a sequence uh, of um, 
let me call them uh, PI actually. Um, no, PI were plus on before, so um, uh, uh, YI. So these will be IID plus on one random variables, and I'll let SN be um, the sum from one to N of YI minus one. And so these are playing the role of the XI in the previous, uh, in the previous proof. Um, and I'll let tau be the smallest k such that sk is minus one. Okay. Then we now know that, that two things. One is that the probability that uh, our Poisson bien aimé has size n, that's the same as the probability that this first hitting time of minus one is n. Okay, but now by the cycle lemma, that probability is one over n times the probability that Sn is uh, is minus one. Okay, that's this this equality is precisely the b equals one case of the cycle lemma. Okay, and now that's just writing out that's one over n times the probability that um, so y one plus y n. I'm moving all these minus ones over to the other side is equal to n minus one. Okay, but these now, these are independent Poisson one. And so the sum, you know, if you sum Poisson random variables, then you get a Poisson random variable whose mean is the sum of the means, right? So this sum here is a Poisson random variable with mean n, okay? And so this whole thing is one over n times the probability that a Poisson n random variable uh, is equal to n minus one. And we all know the um, the formula for that. That's one over n, n to the n minus one, e to the minus n, over n minus one factorial. Okay. So here you 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 know just keep track. This is this is plus on lambda equals k. So you have to use that formula with lambdas n and k is n minus one. Okay. And that's that's the that's what we had up top. N to the n minus one, e to the minus n, over n factorial. Okay. And um, mm, yeah, so just to um, just to um, mention some asymptotics that will um, uh, that 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 follow from this. Okay, um, so if we look at n to the n minus one e to the minus n over n factorial, then Sterling's formula tells us that's one plus little o one over root two pi. Uh, times one over n to the three halves. Okay, so um, you've got an extra, if I had a, if I had a n to the n here, then I would have n to the one half, that's just Sterling, but I have n to the n minus one, so I get an extra um, power of n on the bottom. Okay, and so that says that, um, uh, in particular, the probability that a uh, critical Poisson bien tree has size n is like, order one over n to the three halves. And so also the probability that it has size at least n, if you just sum out over m at least n is like order one over n to the half. So this is quite a quite a heavy tailed random variable. And that will pr probably come up again when we're studying um, random graphs as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, five minutes early. I think it's still better to leave things there than try to rush through um, the duality thing I wanted to show you. Um, even though it's not complicated, I, it's nice and deserves um, to be uh, done, done at the correct pace. So let's, um, let's call that a day. And um, I'm happy to stick around for questions for about 10 minutes, then I have to head home. This proves that the probability is sum to one, Lyra says. Yes, I wrote that up here. <laughs>